Good evening, and welcome to the Dusty Feet. It's the uh, third month, 24th day, 2022 AD. Yes, it's another Thursday night on the Dusty Feet. Uh, we're continuing our homework series, Make Me Clean. And I think this will be a, f a fun one to dig into. Uh, we'll, we'll see where it picks up, where it takes off and the agendas and things that uh, Matthew wants to bring out from this particular story. Um, let's remember that uh, all of these episodes that you can get are all on the dustfeet.com. It's going to be a link to the playlists of each of the groupings that, that we have. Be sure to hit the subscribe button, the bell icon to be reminded. That comes in handy. And uh, Dusty Feet 2 on Twitter for our... Um, any updates that we have. So, make me clean. This is, um, we're in Matthew chapter 8, right? We are early in, in um, Jesus' uh, ministry. It's interesting uh, because obviously in the other gospel accounts, we have more things going on before than... Um, in one accounting than we do in, in this, okay? So uh, we learned that the uh, agendas are here and are very important. And I think we'll have some interesting time looking into and talking about Matthew's particular accounting of this and and uh, and what we can learn and, and, and draw from it, okay? It'll, it'll, it'll challenge us. And as always on the Dusty Feet, this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of God, interconnection of His creation, where belief understandings might be challenged, divine misunderstandings may exist, and traditional te teachings might falter as we pursue connection, context, and community with God and each other here in an environment of grace and love. So here we go with more Branches on the Vine and the Bible Project on the Dusty Feet. Okay, so let's get to the Mackey video. Um, in this particular one, I'm really enjoying Mackey's context here. And I think context, of course, is, is very important for us to understand a, a lot of things and the depth that it can bring out because things that are mentioned to the original audience in context has attaches things. We call them red strings, right? They connect these things in these pieces. So... It'll be uh, another interesting time uh, discussing this particular, what seems like a simple um, miracle. If there's such such thing as simple miracle, I'm not really sure, but a simple, a simple encounter, shall we say. A simple encounter with some very um, profound things to talk about. So let's listen to Mackey um, on Matthew chapter 8. Uh, make me clean. Matthew 8, 1 through 4. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go. Show yourself to the priests who present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. All right. Hey, everybody. How are you guys? Good. Happy Sunday. It's good to be here with you guys. Um, I, really, I really miss Door of Hope. I was away. Some of, you, some of you know that. Actually, probably some of you don't know that. So... Um, uh, there were three of us from Door of Hope, three pastors from Door of Hope, myself, uh, Tom McGregor, and John Abraham, and uh, we were invited um, to, it's like we won the lottery, you guys. Basically, we got this email back in the fall that said, you're invited to come on an all-expenses 10-day trip to 
Israel, Palestine, and to come tour the site. And, and I, it's like one of those emails where you read it and you're like, wait, did I just read that email? So you read it again, you're like, oh yes, that's really what's happening right now. Um, it, was, it was this really uh, unique opportunity. Um, we were invited by an organization, a nonprofit called the Israel Collective. And um, they're a, they've just existed a year or so. Um, and their basic goal is to recruit um, young 20 and 30-something Christian pastors and leaders to go on these trips and just expose them both to the history and heritage of Israel, Palestine, but also to really learn about the complexity of this, the situation and the tensions that are, that are over there right now and to become voices to just pray and advocate for peace in that part of the world. And so, and to have somebody else pay for you to go do that, you're like, what planet am I living on right now? So there are about 35 um, people who went on the trip, and just through different ways, uh, about half of that group were people from Portland, different pastors. There were four churches represented, um, uh, Imago Dei, Bridgetown, uh, Mosaic, and then and Door of Hope. And it was so great, you guys. It was like going to camp. It was like going to camp, junior high camp, but in Israel, because it was like all the Portland people, we were all friends, you know, we all know each other. And so you'll be glad to know we represented Portland well. We were the back of the bus, you're right, <laughs> and like cynical and semi-pretentious and that whole deal, like, so that all went over well. And, uh, but it was just, it was remarkable, you know, and, and so we got to both tour these ancient, you know, places, but also to meet with these people from the very, very, all ends of the spectrum, right? So we had breakfast with an Arab Muslim newspaper reporter, but also had breakfast, you know, with a Jewish rabbi and Israeli military personnel, but then also Palestinian Christian pastors. And they all have very different views of what's happening in that part of the world. And the point was just to meet them, to hear their stories, and to come to our own convictions, you know, about what we need to do and or not do, right, about what's happening over there. Anyway, it was rad, and I really miss Door of Hope because there's nothing quite like Door of Hope anywhere on the planet, in my humble opinion. So it was super great, and I'm really glad to, to be back. It's good to be with you guys. Um, one of the places we went, just the first few days of the trip, were, uh, was up in uh, the northern part of Israel-Palestine called Galilee, and it all centers around the body of water called the Sea of Galilee in the New Testament. And it's, it's not a sea, it's actually a lake. It's a, it's a big lake, but it's a lake nonetheless. And on the northern um, end of the lake is uh, a church, kind of up on a hillside, which you can kind of see a, a picture I took from a, a hillside up on the northern end of the, the Lake of Galilee. And there's a church, there's the Catholic church up there, it's really cool. It's called uh, the Church of the Beatitudes. And it, it commemorates a hillside that's a typical hillside, you know, up on that part of the Sea of Galilee that commemorates Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount, which we just spent three months crawling through, right, on our Sunday gatherings. And so I just thought you might want to see the mountain, right, that's being referred to right there. Because look at the first line here in, in our story today. Jesus came down from the mountainside after, in Matthew, giving the Sermon on the Mount. Now, just, you know, look at the picture. And so that's a mountain in Israel. You know what I'm saying? Right? So we're in the Pacific Northwest, the Cascades. When you hear mountain, you think mountain. Um, when you're in Israel, Palestine, the word mountain means Mount Tabor, right? <laughs> like Southeast Portland, right? So that's about how a little bit taller than Mount Tabor, but that's the idea here. So just imagine Jesus has been up on this hillside. He's been out there announcing the kingdom of God, that it's here. And remember, that's what you would hear Jesus talking about on any given day, announcing the nearness of the kingdom of God, that it's here in him and in what he's doing. And so he has all these followers, so he goes up to this hillside, up from the sea, and just that's a typical scene right there. You can just see for miles and miles all around, and so Jesus, he's up on this hillside, people are gathered around, and for three chapters he's exploring and explaining what it means to be his disciple and what it means to enter into the life of God's kingdom. And then today is significant because we, we finished the Sermon on the Mount and we're going into a new section of the book of Matthew as we go through it. And here it's where Jesus comes down off the hillside and he starts going down in entering into just day-to-day -day life in these small villages and towns that kind of dot the whole landscape along the shore of this, the Sea of Galilee. And the first story 
that Matthew tells us of Jesus re-entering and now bringing the kingdom not in, in his words, but in his actions and in his reality. The first story Matthew tells us is a story about this guy with a skin disease who approaches Jesus and, and walks away from that encounter just completely transformed. And this is the setting where Jesus performed and did these very things. It's a, it's a wonderful, quiet, pretty un, still today a fairly undeveloped part of the, the country. And it's serene, and you can see Jesus walking in bare feet in your imagination, and it's, it's awesome, existential and all that, right? Okay. So, uh, but that's the setting of this, of this story right here. So let's come back to the story. It's a very simple story, and it's short. Josh got three quarters of a chapter last week. I get four verses this week. It's great. So Jesus comes down off the hillside, all these crowds around him, and this, this man with leprosy. Now, some of your Bibles might have a little footnote around that word right there. And in our vocabulary, leprosy, I'm not a doctor, so I don't, I'm just quoting a dictionary right now. So our, our word leprosy has a specific reference to a certain kind of skin condition called elephantitis or Hansen's disease, something like that. In the Bible, it's much broader. It's, in the Bible refers to, leprosy refers to a much broader uh, set of skin conditions. So we don't actually know what this guy's deal was but he's got a skin disease of some kind. And he comes and he kneels in front of Jesus. And look at at verse 2. Look at how he approaches Jesus. It's really remarkable, his words. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you are able to make me clean. So just stop and think about that. I I think most of us, on a first reading, what we probably heard him say is, if you are able... Will you make me clean? But that's not what he says, is it? Do you see the difference between those two? So I think most of us, we would, we would wonder, is Jesus capable of doing anything about my problem, about my situation? Will you do something? But that is not this guy's question. Do you see? He comes, and his question is not whether Jesus is capable of d- dealing with his sickness and his disease. Do you see that, right? Are you guys with me here? Do you see see what I'm saying? It's a very simple little observation, but it's profound. What is this guy asking for? He is convinced that Jesus can help him. He's like, yeah, you're totally able to help me. How How does he know that? Well, Jesus, right, he's been up on the mountainside. The stories are starting to spread about him. We're told that he has already been healing some people from their sicknesses. This is the first story about an example of that. But somehow he's, he's convinced that Jesus can heal him. But what he's not certain about is whether Jesus would do something like that. And so he, what he's not certain about is Jesus' character. He knows that Jesus is powerful, but th- he doesn't know that Jesus is good or compassionate because this is apparently his first time encountering him. And so that's what this story is about. This guy, he comes to Jesus and he asks, are you willing? Would you help somebody like me? And the story is very simple and powerful. Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him. And notice how the, the story just slows down on this moment, right? It's just, you can see Jesus' hand extending and touching. It's like Matthew wants to focus and do slow-mo, right? On this moment right here. And Jesus says, absolutely, I'm, I'm not only capable, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And he says something that we'll talk about in a minute, but that's the story. It's a very simple, short little story, isn't it? You guys get it? It's great. It's a great story. Um, If you didn't know anything about Jesus, let's say this is the first time you're reading any stories about Jesus. This is the first story of Jesus healing somebody. Let's say you don't know anything about the Old Testament scriptures and you don't know anything about Jewish culture, right? You can just read this story and what do you conclude about Jesus? (laughs) Good guy, bad guy. It's a good guy, right? Uh, compassionate or mean? Compassionate, right? Concerned about the well-being of others or selfish? He's concerned, right. He's awesome, right? You read this. It's a very simple story. You don't have to be a scholar or anything. You read it, and you just go, this guy's awesome. I like this guy a lot. Are you with me here? It's very simple. And that's how, actually, most of the stories in, in the gospel accounts, the four gospel accounts in the New Testament, they're like that. You read them, and there's... A whole layer, there's just, they're very simple to get in one sense. Jesus is awesome. 
He's incredible. He's compassionate. He's brilliant. He's profound. He's lo- he loves others. He lays down his life for others. And it's a very powerful story about Jesus being willing and compassionate to move. I mean, how significant is it for this guy? Why does Matthew highlight G- in slow-mo this moment of Jesus touching him? What's this guy's problem? He has a skin disease, right? So when do you think was the last time someone embraced this man and hugged him and, or touched him? And what happens to human beings when we're deprived of touch from other people? It's not good. It's not, right? Actually, physiologically, bad things happen to us when we're deprived of embrace and touch from other people. And so Matthew focuses on this, this beautiful, humane compassion of Jesus to touch this man that no one else would want to touch and to embrace him and the encounter heals him. Jesus is awesome. So we could just stop right there. You know, we could. Um, we're not, I'm not going to, but, but we could. All right, and just walk away and be like, Jesus is incredible. But he's even more incredible than that just simple reading of the story would, would lead you to, to know. There's a simple layer to the story, as there, as there are with all the stories of the Gospels. They're easy to grasp, but there are always layers. These stories are like onions, right? And you can, you can see it's an onion, and it is what it is, but you can start peeling it back and be like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to this story, and there is a lot to this story. Why did Matthew choose this story as the first story to put in front of us after Jesus walks down off the hillside, right? Because... For a, for a Jewish reader, for somebody who does know the storyline of the Old Testament scriptures, this, this story is category breaking. It just breaks all, shatters everything you thought you knew about the Bible and about God in, in different ways. And it's all wrapped up in one word. Look again, look down at verse 2 with me. There's one word that's at the center of the story. What does the guy ask Jesus? He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can do what? What does he say? You can make me clean. Now, why does he say that? Is he dirty? You know? Um, does he have dirt all over him or something? Like what? And you, and you might say, well, he has a skin disease. But yes, but you could have very good personal hygiene and have a skin disease. You know what I'm saying? You brush your teeth and take a shower. So he's not dirty. He's not actually dirty. But he, sa- he asked to become clean. Why does he use that word? And and Jesus affirms it. He says, be cleansed. What is this about? There's a perfectly good words in Greek and in Hebrew for healing, for being healed. But that is not what he asks for. Of course, he he is asking to be healed, but there's something even more that he's asking for. He's asking to become clean again. And that little word opens up a whole dimension of, of power and significance to this short little story, and I think for why Matthew, Matthew puts it first. And so you guys know me, the story time, the story time now. So get your coffee, have a sip, and we're going we're gonna to explore why Matthew puts this first, what this whole concept of cleanness and hol- holiness and uncleanness is about, and why this story should break all your categories of what you thought you knew about God, right? You guys with me? Story time. So let me tell you a story about the people of Israel. Uh, so go back to the beginning. Everything's awesome. Could have been wonderful, but we blew it. It's a pretty good summary, right? And so we blew it and create hell on earth. And God chooses one family out of all the corrupt, stupid, rebellious nations called the family of Abraham. And he's going to restore blessing and goodness to all humanity through this family. They end up in slavery to the big bad guy in Egypt right? You've seen the movie. And so Moses uh, is raised up as a leader to rescue the people out of slavery in Egypt. And so they go through the wilderness to the foot of a mountain. Okay, here we go. This is what's important. And God enters into a covenant relationship with this family, the tribe of Israel. And he wants them to become his people. And more so, he wants to restore that Garden of Eden presence relationship that we were all made for but have forfeited and, and lost. And so what, he, what God does is he wants to plant his personal presence right in the midst of this family in Israel. And so the form that that takes is what? And the form that that takes in the people of Israel. Some of you know the story. What, what is the structure and the thing in their midst here? It's a tent. Right? Well, actually, it's a box. It's a little special box carried on poles by priests. 
and then there's the presence of, of God and this cloud and so on is over it. And then that goes in this sacred tent that they build to house the presence of God right at the center of the people of Israel. And what's that tent called in the Bible? It's called the tabernacle. And the whole, the whole point of this was that God's unique holy presence is in the midst of, of Israel. And so here's just one of many passages from one of your favorite books in the Bible, right? Leviticus. <laughs> where God describes the significance and the implications of planting his presence right in the middle of the people of Israel. So this is what God, God says to the Israelites. He says, I am Yahweh your God. Make yourselves holy, therefore, and become holy because I am holy. You shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the defiling things that are in the land, for I am Yahweh, who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. What's the repeated word here in this paragraph? Holy. All right. Very good, class. Very good, you guys. So, holy. So, really, to, here's what's about to happen. <laughs> We're going to... We're going to take some time and learn about concepts of holiness and cleanness and uncleanness and purity from the book of Leviticus. That's my mission right now. <laughs> so how many of you would want that mission, right? You'd be like, no, you don't want that. I'm going to put you all to sleep right now, but I'm not. Just watch. You're, it, this will be fun. Trust me. So holiness. This all comes down around holiness. And once you these are such central concepts to the storyline of the Bible. Really, once you get these, they're pretty simple to grasp. Once you grasp them, seriously, whole parts of the Bible will begin to, to come alive with significance and meaning, and you'll begin to spot these language and ideas all over the stories about Jesus and in the, in the New Testament, too. It's really important. So God, here's, here's the point. God is holy, and he's going to plant himself in the midst of Israel, and so they are to become holy, too. Now, what on earth does holiness mean? Um, for most of us, we think of, I think in English, Western culture, we think of holiness mostly in terms of, of morality, being a good moral person. You guys with me? That's what most of us, he's so holy, or he thinks he's holy, holier than thou, this kind of thing. But, and when we say that, we mean they think they're a better person morally than other people. And morality is, is a part of it holiness in the Bible, but it's just one part, it's, and it's not even the main, the main part. So this word that gets repeated a whole bunch of times right there, the Hebrew word, it's the word kadosh. 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 Good job, class. And whatever kadosh is, you see here, it's set up in opposition. It's the opposite of unclean. You guys with me? So don't Un oh, I did this. There we go. Unclean. There we go. I can spell. I can spell. So uh, you have holiness, so don't become unclean because y'all are to become holy, just like I am holy, in your midst. So kadosh. What on earth does, does that uh, mean? And its, its basic meaning is to be unique, to be unique, one of a kind, distinct, different, whatever words you want to use. And because of that uniqueness, somehow... Um, you're set apart. To be holy is to be one of a kind, unique, and then set apart for a specific purpose. So here's, a, here's an analogy uh, that I found helpful. In the Bible, God is holy, and therefore the space around God is holy, and people who are near God are supposed to become holy. holy uh, God is holy uh, in the same way that in a hospital, an operating room is holy. So how many of you have ever... Um, been in, wheeled into an operating room before? Okay, quite a number of us. How many of you have been in a hospital before? Okay, now that's interesting. So here's what, here's what that means. That means there's these buildings all over town that we've, most of us have been into, but they have a special room that you've never been into. Very few of us have ever been in, and only under certain circumstances and for a set amount of time for a specific purpose. It's holy. Right? It's holy. It's set apart, and it's unique. Now, what, it, what is that space? What is an operating room set apart and holy for? What happens in that room? Surgery, right? Operations. And what is the, what's the purpose of operations? For 99%, that room is set apart for people to go into, and they have some kind of life-threatening condition, 
or they have a sickness, something going wrong with their body, their quality of living is really bad because of something with their body. So the purpose of that room is about saving life and improving people's quality of life. That's the only reason that room exists. And the only reason you're supposed to ever go into that room is for that purpose. You guys with me? And who can go into that room? So the patient, all right, but who, what are the special people who can go into that room? They're also unique, set apart people. So surgeons, doctors, and nurses, and what kind of process do they have to undergo before walking into this holy space? Right? They have to st be sterilized. Well, school? Did you say a lot of school? Years of school. That's true. And so that's true. It's this long process of becoming set apart and holy. And then you have to take, take off your other clothes, put on special clothes, wash your hands, be sterilized, mask, that whole deal. What's happening? What's happening? What, these are rituals, right? They're rituals that are all about this reality that this is a unique holy space that is dedicated to saving life and improving the, the quality of people's life. That's what this space is for. And so there are all kinds of things out here that would threaten to contaminate this space, right? So there's dog poop on your shoe, right? So do you, like, don't wear that shoe if you're a doctor into the, that thing. You know what I'm saying? Right? So whatever, you have a runny nose and you just wiped your hands or whatever. Like, so call another doctor if, he has a runny no if you have a runny nose. So they do the surgery and not you so you don't drip you know, your mucus into their open brain cavity or something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about. Are you guys with me here? So we get this. This is intuitive. So, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't say that at the nine. But you guys get what I'm saying. That we get this. I'm trying to use concepts that we, that we resonate with to help us understand what seems like this weird, backwards, foreign part of the Bible. Right? So we get this. This totally makes sense to us. And in the Bible... God's holiness is like that. So God's holiness is, is mostly connected, we'll see this in, in a minute here, to the fact that God is unique and one of a kind as the author and creator of all life and all that is good and beautiful and just and pure. And so when God takes up personal residence amidst people, they too are to become like that too and reflect that in their, in their own lives. And so there's to be this distinction, right? This separation between anything that's marked by the opposite of that that could contaminate it or could defile it, right? And so there's actually a very clear list of ways that you become unclean. If you're an Israelite, you can read the book of Leviticus and Numbers, right? your, your second favorite book of the Bible. And there's very clear ways that you become unclean. The rules are very clear. They're not difficult. It's very clear. Numbers chapter 5. Let's just read from your second favorite book of the Bible right now. Yahweh said to Moses, command the Israelites to send outside of the Israelite camp anybody who has a defiling skin disease, one, or two, a sexual discharge of any kind, or three, who, someone who's ceremonially unclean because of contact with a dead body. There you go, right there. Skin disease, sexual discharge, contact with a dead body. Whether they're a man or woman, send them outside the camp so they don't defile the camp where I dwell among them. Now, this may seem weird and backwards to you. And I, so I, <laughs> here's the deal. <laughs> Anytime that we open the Bible and we forget People forget this when they become accustomed to the Bible over years of being a part of a church community. It's that you're, you're flying to another land and another culture when you open the pages of the Bible. It's a cross-cultural experience. And what's funny is that many people, especially in Western culture, we, we end up thinking the Bible is backwards or archaic or stupid and primitive or somehow. But if you were to have that mindset of flying to some other country in the world today, and they'd view the world differently. It's a totally different culture. And you were like, how stupid and primitive these people. So you would be called the most closed-minded, intolerant. You know what I'm saying? But we have that mindset all the time when we open the pages of the Bible. It's because we're closed-minded, right, to the Bible. And we're not open to another way of seeing the world in reality. And so let's just humble ourselves for a second here. There's something actually really profound underneath all, all of this. So it seems weird to us. So there's something about these these three things, skin disease, sexual discharge, coming in contact with a dead body, that they make you 
become unclean, which is like a, a status, it's a state, it's like having a cold or having a sickness. You, you wouldn't want somebody with a runny nose and a head cold who just buried their family dog in the backyard and then not wash their hands and then waltz into the operating room and start touching everything. You know what I'm saying? That's gross. We get, we get that. And in the same way, these three things mark you with a status that prevent you from coming into the holy space. And you can kind of just put it together, like a skin disease. You can kinda, that's kind of intuitive. You can say, yeah, like that's, you're marked by disease and death in some way, and so you shouldn't waltz into the holy space where the author of life is. You've contacted a dead body, you know, just waltzing into the holy space. You can kind of kind of make sense of that. Now, sexual discharges. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this right now in church. We're going to talk about this. And again, because this might seem stupid to you, but it's, it's actually really, it's really profound. What are, we, what are we talking about here? We're talking about fluids, unique fluids in your body <laughs> that, that have a, un, they are holy, they're sacred, because those fluids have a unique purpose that's associated with the creation of life, Right? Because when, those flu when, when man and woman make a covenant partnership with each other and those fluids mix, I trust that we're not learning anything here right now, right? So, right? When those fluids combine, humans are created. That is incredible. That is si and life is sacred and profound. And those fluids are sacred and holy. And there's something unique about them. Like if I sp spit on the ground, and then, you know, you spit on the ground, new humans aren't created. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's not what happens. There's something unique and set apart about these fluids in a man and in a woman. They're unique and holy. And so, when they, when in the context of covenant and so on, but when those fluids, so to speak, leak out of your body on some other occasion that are, is not connected to the purpose of making new humans, it makes you unclean. It's like you're leaking life fluid, so to, so to speak, right? So I get, and that's not how we think about it, but that's how they thought about it. And it's actually kind of profound that, that reproductive fluids are so sacred and holy that when, they, when you're exposed to them, it's like they're radioactive or something like that, right? They put you in this status of unclean. And so what, what's underneath all of this? I think a, sim a simple way is that all three of these ways of becoming unclean, you've come into contact with something that reminds you and that's a symbol and a reality of your mortality and death, right? You're leaking life fluids. You've touched your dead body. Your skin is disintegrating or have a disease in some way. And so this is a whole cultural symbol system that's meant to say this. It's meant to say that God is the author of all life, has taken up residence here in our midst among the people of Israel. And so we're going to honor and recognize the holiness and the goodness of God's presence by keeping away anything that would contaminate or defile it. Now, here's two things. One is the most major misconception that, that we tend to have about this whole concept of being in, unclean and so on is that somehow it's wrong or that it's sinful. And that is not the case. In the Bible, becoming unclean is not wrong. You're not a sinner if you become unclean because you had to bury your ancestor, your grandfather or something. Becoming unclean is a natural part of the cycles of life in, in, human, in human life and so on. That's not what's wrong. It's temporary, right? You, you, after seven days pass or whatever, you take a bath, go offer sacrifice, and you're clean again. That's, that's the way it goes. Except for the guy with the skin disease, right? Because he's, um, if that skin disease goes on and it's prolonged, then all of a sudden he's blocked from all contact. He can't go into the holy space and so on. And so what's, what's wrong is not being unclean, just like having a cold is not sinful or wrong. What was wrong for them was to waltz into the holy space when you're in an unclean state. Because symbolically you're bringing death into the presence of the author of life. And so this is what uh, is, is uh, safeguarded against and sending them outside the camp. You guys with me here? So this is their culture, right? This is just Israelite. This is just Israelite culture. That's kind of abrupt. Could have been a better fade. Anyways, so we're, we're getting a, a snapshot into that. So let's talk about this.
because there's a lot to unpack in here and um, and some other context things to, to think about. Um, so let's go to the beginning. Coming down from the mountain. So again, um, I'm from California uh, originally, um, being in, in uh, Charleston and Savannah. Uh, the topography is very, 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 very different. Ask my mom and dad. And um, so when I think of mountains, I'm thinking, yeah, Sierra Nevadas, like he's talking about the Cascades. That's, uh, that's mountains to me, not, uh, not the bumps that are the hills that are there. However, I thought that was a, a, a cute little context. Um, you know, I, Tim does a good job of mentioning things, and I believe he's very intentional on his words. He tries to be very careful. He's very intentional, and I, I enjoy that about him. So that, that's how we can have fun and, and, and bounce back and forth on some things and cho choices of those things. Um, he, he mentions that this church that's on there um, commemorates um, this hillside uh, that this is where they came down and had this because we don't really know exactly for sure where, right? Um, but it's tr traditional that this is the place. There's a tradition that goes with this in particular part. And in this one, tradition's fine, right? That's fine uh, because may it may it bring uh, a, a thought process, a, a learning to things, okay? Um, willing not versus Abel, but willing in relation to Abel, okay? And not Abel the person, but Abel the uh, ability. Um, Tim brings up a very good point about what this guy is asking. Because he is aware of, uh, of certain things. This is, this is, according to Matthew anyways, this is early in his ministry, okay? Um, we have uh, mentions of, earlier in Matthew about healings and some of the miracles and those kind of things. And, and, and that's there. It's not until, um, here where we get this, the, this intimate in, in encounter, uh, Mark, um, mentions this event, um, in the first chapter. Okay. At the end of the first chapter. So it's, it's, it's early in, in, in his time frame. Um, Um, Jesus is is very early and the rumors are spreading. Okay. And yes, I use the word rumors. It's intentional. Okay. Um, unless you were healed firsthand or saw something firsthand, which people would, mind you, there were. By the time it gets to you, it's a rumor because you don't know what happened. It's up to you to trust the source. This particular leper, it's probably safe to say it's a rumor because he hasn't seen anything yet because he's not in the community context. He is not going to be one of the people up on the mountain listening because he's not allowed to be there. Okay. Um, these, these, these kind of um, skin issues, it really it kept you out of general society. You weren't, um, you weren't allowed to, to be there. You were outside the camp. You were outside the city. You were outside the gates. You had your own um, groupings. I, I, uh, it's uh, to use the term community loosely. Okay. Um, and it's, it's an e interesting. We don't get... These are scrolls, right? And we don't get the breaks that happen. And I think this is a, a poor chapter verse break on, on Matthew's, on what we do. Don't forget, Matthew doesn't have verses. He doesn't have chapters. He's telling stories, okay, with an agenda. He has a plan. He's trying to convey some points, okay? And this particular point where we have uh, coming off the mountain and then the, the, the leper, um, you you think you get the inclination that he would that the crowds are there's this throng following him as he comes down the deal and then he meets this leper we get in context later by comparison of the stories is that no he's isolated with this man and that would be contextually more accurate because again 
The crowd is not going to be hanging around with people that are unclean. Okay, so um, th th forget this hierarchy. The, the important people, they're not getting anywhere near this guy. Not anywhere near this guy. Um, so what, what I hear him asking, like he said, when you're looking, this is what I hear him asking on this one. Based on what I've heard, are you willing to heal me too and cleanse me? Based on what I've heard, are you willing to heal me too and cleanse me? Okay? Cleanse me. Um, would you help somebody like me? Um, Matthew has, again, r r r recorded miracles prior to chapter 4. But this is this first... This is an intimate encounter, and and Tim breaks up a brings up a very good point about this this slow motion move. If if you were filming this particular piece, it would be, uh, yeah, you 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 would be focusing in on this particular point uh, when he's reaching out, and it would be a slow, intentional. I'm th this is a a moment, okay. Um, He touches him. These people are not touched. The only touch they would get would be from other unclean people. Okay, other than that, they're untouched. In our society today, we use this as a punishment. Solitary confinement. We isolate people to punish them. This is not a punishment. It's just that they have to be outside because it's unclean and unsafe. Um, I, I, I love um, Tim's uh, analogy of, of hospital. Oh my gosh, I thought that was an absolutely brilliant um, uh, analogy to talk about um, space and uh, to help us grasp the... Um, this point of clean and unclean. Um, because what we're, because for us, we, we get in this, the first century culture and we think that separation, we think that, that that's unclean and sin. Okay. So let's remember, this is going to be one of those weird if and buts things. So this is going to be where, okay. So all sin makes you unclean. Fair? For, for, reasons on coming into the holy place okay and that's what we have certain sin sacrifices for to deal with those issues okay but not all uncleanliness is sinful not all uncleanliness is sinful it's not wrong to have dog poop on your shoe it's wrong to bring that dog poopy shoe into an or fair it's not to be an unlicensed doctor or nurse or technician in there, somebody that hasn't had the education, the care, the concern, all that that goes with it, to, to, to enter that space, that's wrong. Okay? That's wrong. That would be, I, I would say, the equivalent we're looking to draw math for a sin. Um, but uh, in, in drawing that, that, Sin, clean, unclean scenario. We really need to separate those two because it's very, very important. Because each of the meetings with lepers that we see in Scripture, there's no point of where Jesus has helped other people, healed them, dealt with certain issues, and he goes to say, sin no more. Or he's intervened on something, he says, sin no more. Doesn't say that with these. None of them. He might give them instruction, we'll talk about that, but... It's not sin no more, because this isn't a sin issue. This is merely something that separates you and has not allowed them to do things, to be engaged in society, to be able to take their sacrifices up to the temple, to be able to interact with God at that intimate, personal level. Okay? Um, I love the, the, the purpose of the operating room is to, to heal people to improve quality of life. And uh, 
there's lots of analogies you could throw, uh, protect, da, da, da. There's all kinds of things. And you go, there's so much about God and his son in this that just, it just, it just proliferates that particular analogy. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and it, and it, it, it draws us into a picture that we, if this was a, uh, um, a parable we're hearing today or announcing here today, that this would resonate with us. That is resonating with them there when Jesus had his parables and these things. Okay. Um, this is what I got out of out of that part of that analogy too, when it comes to the priests and the people and all those kind of things. Special people in a special place. And they need to understand what it takes to go in there. Schooling, one of the guys mentioned, right? Years of schooling. Um, in those favorite books that 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 Mackie goes, and he's being a little a little um, tongue in cheek about it, uh, Leviticus and Numbers, because I, I think we tend to slough them off and in to our to our loss. I don't think we realize how much we lose by not studying and knowing those books. We lose. And we don't have the opportunity to see something further on in Scripture because we don't know and understand that. I believe that ever so much, okay? Um, but in those books, it tells them what they need to do da, 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 and how to cleanse themselves to prepare to go into the tabernacle and into the holies. Um, you would say that there's there's even there's layers inside of the OR to get to the to the actual OR. There's rooms that have there's a room you go into here and you get into there and then you're going to go and you're going to change clothes. You're going to strip out. You're going to go into the cleansing room and you're going to cleanse and you're going to go from the cleansing room into that space. And I I and I love that. Um, again, if we if we try to kind of walk a tabernacle analogy in there, I think there's. There's a lot you you could un, unpack in that. Um, there's some people I'd love to talk about that with and see what else we, we could un unpack and and and, and g grab out. Um, you know the, the practical aspect of them and their and their understanding in this space is that you know they don't have showers, they don't have baths. They and in the context, especially of um, Leviticus and Numbers, these are children. In the wilderness, in tents, okay, with this nomadic camp that they're dragging around, right, and they're setting up, and he's saying, I can't have these unclean things in proximity to my space. Uh, there's there's things that tells you when you go out to go poop, right, go outside the camp, bring a shovel, a little hand shovel, so you can bury it. Okay, I don't think, again, where we think those things don't matter, and da, 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 I, 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 again, I think we've we make it's a big mistake for us not to do that. And you go, well, well, that works. Well, duh, you know, um, and, and and it tells you what to do when they're not after they do and they cleanse and they do that. They come back sundown, come back into the camp, and they're fine, except the skin disease people. Okay. And that's where we're walking in this one, and we'll be walking down. Um, there's there's a, a lot to unwrap here. Um, we have this, and th this is my this is my take. So I'll take this. I'm adding on to something that Matthew's talking about. We have Matthew is a, is trying to tell a story and trying to sell an agenda, right? And don't forget, we have this prophet likened unto Moses that talks about with with um, with um, Jesus, and he's so so coming off the mountain. Um, um, Moses came off the mountain, and then things started. There, there was a lot that happened on there. Granted, we get what happened off the mountain and on those pieces, and and we get that. Except for them misbehaving, that's supposed to be the beginning of a whole nother stretch. A whole nother thing continues right after this. There's like there's this covenant that's being expounded upon 
that's happening. And I'm wondering if maybe a little bit of the Matthew's viewing the Sermon on the Mount discussion pieces, maybe a little bit. Um, that uh, that I, I'm wondering if he's. It's almost like it's a covenant thing with the children again. And he's up there and he's laying it out. He's laying out his kingdom at this point. He's laying out his kingdom at this point. So go back, look back at um, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Okay, look back. And tell me what you feel, what your think is with that. Just chew on that a little bit. Not because, like he said, that's over a cup of coffee or tea. So I like my coffee. So, and and really think about how that fits in the um, in in that context piece, because I think that's interesting uh, to think about. And him um, coming off the the, the mountain. Um, so, chew on that. Um, And that's going to take us, and we're going to drag us into part two. And part two, we're going to get into more to the clean and unclean. Uh, I, I want to expand that a little more um, and, and, and let us kind of stretch that as Matthew, as Mackey, Tim Mackey brings up some more points um, as we continue the, because this, this will be a two part series. So we're going to cover that in, in, in part two. So I'm going to wrap this up here. Uh, and, and one thing that I want you to, also ponder, like I said, go back and look over, also ponder is we have this particular point that uh, Matthew is telling in a story and what he wants us to see and hear and listen to, okay? And we talk about the agendas of authors. If you don't think that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't have an agenda, you haven't read the books, you haven't heard the stories, you haven't paid attention, okay? They're very much, they have a purpose. There's, there's a story that they're telling with these stories, right? So with that in mind, why are the two, um, the two tellings of this particular event Told, and there's interesting differences in them. There's interesting differences in them. Maybe we'll address it a little bit next week, too. That'll probably be a good thing to... Or not next week, but next time we do this, we'll, um, we'll address that. Because there's differences between the Matthew account and Mark's account. Mark's is at the end of his first chapter, uh, verse 40 to 45, I think. Um, and... Um, they're different. And you actually get a little more of a hint of where we want to go here with this, with, with part of it. And it, it, it gets addressed a little bit, but we're going to make sure that we bring it up here because Tim chose to emphasize, and I think it's important, the clean and unclean. So there's there's a point that, that isn't mentioned um, with, well, they, they actually, they're, they're, they're both mentioned. They're just a little difference on how they're played out and how the end pl plays off. But I really want us to emphasize on those. So we'll definitely cap capture those in part two as, as we get there. Um, so just mull on that, on those points. I, 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 I think, I think there's something to be gained, um, from that. Okay. So a point to ponder as we wrap this up totally, a point to ponder. I like, right now I'm enjoying C.S. Lewis quotes, so we're going to continue on the C.S. Lewis quote. Miracles are retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. Miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. 
Thanks, C.S. Lewis. And thanks for being with us tonight on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>